Hello everyone and welcome to Spokes, the Urban Cycling Institute podcast. Uh, today here I have with me Justin Spinney from Cardiff University. Hello. And, <laughs> hello. And, uh, and we are here at the Cycling Research Board second annual conference in the city of Delft. So happy to have you us, uh, with us, Justin. Very happy to be here, George. Thank you. Cool. So uh, tell us a bit about what you're presenting today. Okay, so presentation today, well actually tomorrow, um, is going to be on some work that my colleague uh, Wenny Lin uh -huh. at National Taipei University have been doing on public bike share in Shanghai, and um, which has really led us to looking, we'll be looking at Dockless public bike share there, and it's really kind of led us to um, looking at data of all things. When we started the project, it wasn't what we thought we'd be looking at, but we've been looking at um, how as a form of surveillance capitalism, effectively, the likes of Mobike and Ofo um, are taking our data, our behavioral surplus, as Zuboff calls it, and um, turning that into predictive products, whether that be transport models or selling to advertisers or finance companies, um, because it, it tells them something extra about us and mm. our habits, likes, dislikes, and those kind of things. So it's really, uh, kind of an investigative exploratory piece of research just looking at how the humble bicycles of vehicles become a, a vehicle for harvesting of our data effectively so time cycling into these other kind of economies things like the data oh, economy so yeah that's it wow and uh so in in this research who's doing the selling and who's doing the buying and what's problematic about the current situation well th th this is the thing and and you know it's partly a descriptive uh. piece of research in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just trying not to crash. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, part of the show, okay. It's partly a descriptive piece of research in the sense of we're just, we're not saying this, this necessarily will come to pass. It may be that the likes of Mobike and Ofo and these other companies won't be able to monetize their data. Um, mm -hmm. And so one of the scenarios is that they just go under. They, they can't make money out of their business model, as it were. Um, but, you know, we're, we're more interested in the sort of governance implications of it. The fact is that maybe it we'll was make before, right. make a right. Perhaps before it was the municipality who owned that transport data and mm -hmm. could make that model of cyclist behavior whereas now that's now owned by a private company um, and so they'll be selling that to the city so partly it's about rights to ownership and governance of data but also in terms of us as citizens you know we we hire that bike we get a service but there's no real transparency about what data is being collected on us who it's going to how it's going to be used as it were um, so we're just kind of try trying to ask those kind of questions, really. Yeah. Um, here we're, we're coming up to a construction site. Uh, so they, they still take care of the bikes, generally, when they, they do construction. Um, and then we'll, we'll take a bit of a route back into the city center, uh, give our viewers a nice look into <laughs> the historic center of Delft. Cool. Uh, so we'll make a right up here. Uh, and uh, I want to also talk to you a bit about your uh, paper in 2011, Meaning Methods, uh, and where you write about uh, video ethnography. Yeah, sure. And you really pioneered it back in the days when yeah. you had to use a, a handy cam, right? It, uh, and you had to really rig up something uh, very specific. And yeah. that was before the era of GoPro. So yeah. how, how, how complicated was that piece of research? Well, uh, well um Firstly, hats off to you, George. You kind of taking it forward, and you're, you're having seen you set this up. You're the total pro. So, um, yeah, I feel like a bit of a dinosaur now when we actually think about it. In the days before the GoPro, definitely uh, <laughs> says something. But um, yeah, you know, it's funny because like so much research, it's kind of contingent. It never seemed uh, in any way innovative, and and you know, like a lot of things, wasn't necessarily completely thought through. I just. I had this mission, this idea that I wanted to try and get to the experience of cycling. And so I was just trying different ways of kind of doing this and seeing what each method gave me and what it didn't. And uh, what, you know, I tried cycling around London, talking <laughs> to cyclists. And that, ah, okay. that, that turned out that that was probably not going to end well. Um, <laughs> so we kind of ditched that. And um, I mean, it, it says something as a method. 
yeah. you know, the brokenness of that and uh, the, the kind of fraughtness of it says something about cycling in London at the time as a method. But yeah, we, we ended up on this, this idea, okay, we'll film the journey um, and then we'll play that journey back and we'll be able to, you know, talk about that in, in a kind of, in a safer interview context and what that might, what that kind of might, you know, offer us really. Right, because what we're doing right here would not be at all possible in London. We'd get honked at, you'd probably be, you know, yeah. passing really close to, I mean, to I mean, buses this is the and thing, stuff. I, I'm new to this town, yeah. this is kind of day, day two in this town, but already I feel like I can do this on a bike that I'm quite familiar with. It's got no proper brakes, um, <laughs> you know, uh, um, but I'm not fearing for my life and mm. I, can, I can talk. I've got enough bandwidth in my head to kind of think a bit on my yeah. feet um, and talk to you. So yeah, it is a completely, completely different thing that as you say, could, could we just go into London and do this even now? I don't think so. You know, London's, London's a different place from what it was 15 years ago uh -huh. in some ways when I, when I was doing my PhD research there, but I'm pretty sure we can do this. <laughs> you, you mentioned the idea of bandwidth and uh, Marco Tabromastrut and, and a group of people at the Urban Cycling Institute, yeah. we've been thinking about this idea of flow and how, you know, uh, if we, if we, have a certain degree of mental workload yeah uh it actually helps us think yeah so we it's like the 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 zone where you know you're exerting physical energy you're paying attention to your surrounding yeah but it leads to a, a better conversation because there's more going on in your head rather than if we were just sitting down yeah and, and talking to each other what do you think about that well we, I mean, we, and we've had some nice presentations i think at the crv talking uh, talking about that and you know the ideas of sensory overload and um our spatial awareness and and things like that so yeah. um <laughs> you know I, I think there's <laughs> there is definitely a lot to be said for it i i think i think one of the things we we have to be careful of and it's easy to fall into a trap of when we're using things like video or doing anything in mm -hmm. fact that we end up focusing on the key events those things that really stand out to people and they really kind of remember but actually kind of things that are sort of uneventful are yeah. worth focusing on as well. Um, and actually I think video can be useful for that because you know, there may be big sections where maybe there's not that much happening. Cool. But that, that's, that's meaningful in itself, right? <laughs> if you can, if yeah, you can this... drift off as it were, what, what does that say about your experience and, and how you're experiencing safety and your environment and all these different things. So yeah, I think, um, I think video, uh, you know, and again, it becomes, it becomes about your focus. If you become too focused on events, as it were, then mm -hmm. same with any method, but video perhaps, video might lead us down that path a bit more if we're not careful because of the sort of visuality of the event, you know. Yeah, and I, when I do my interviews with my participants from the ride along research, you know, that, that I always ask them like, come on, one to 10, how is the infrastructure? One to 10, how is the environment? Uh, we'll make a right across the bridge okay, cool. and uh, just just as some way to the compare one segment or one moment of fleeting experience to the next. But it's it's not always fruitful, uh, yeah. even uh, trying to left, trying to put this experience uh, in terms of a momentary number, even when I give the instruction of like, let's let's say for example, past 400 meters yeah. on a scale of one to 10, how was the infrastructure right. one yes. to 10? Yeah. yeah. I mean, and that, you know, I think that, you know, we've passed through so much in the last 400 <laughs> meters that, that I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. Um, you, you know, what it, what it was, it certainly wasn't particularly fraught. It was probably a bit more fraught because mm. I'm trying to think about what I'm saying as well, you know, um, in Ooh, a way that we wouldn't okay. normally. Um, but but yeah, I, I just I think that's a problem with some of those kind of audit tools that you have out there. That it says, you know, what was the last 400 meters like, and actually it was so varied, yeah, that you couldn't really say anything. Perhaps the video allows us to remember that a bit more and sort of break that down. Um, when you did your ethnographic study uh, in, in in the UK, you did the interviews afterwards, right? And there yes. was no. Did you record the ride at all? What was the relationship between uh, the, the during the ride and after the ride? Yeah, so I mean, with each participant, I kind of I first started by 
you know, just getting a bit of familiarity, establishing a rapport, just talking about them and a kind of cycling biography in a way. Um, and then, and then with then with how the long actual, did that take? The, the establishing, yeah. So that thing. was usually just kind of a, a couple of hours, you know, very leisurely. Oh, I didn't have that. Though. Chat. Okay, I just went like boom right in. Yeah, yeah. well, perhaps that that was more important in some ways in a London context because there are more cyclists than there are people that just use bikes, mm, okay. as it were. So you know, it was more of an identity that had been consciously taken on. So it was looking at where you know how cyclists being being a cyclist had come to feature in their lives in, yeah. in some ways. So maybe that's why that was a bit more important, I think. Um, yeah, and then the rides themselves, I tried to film three rides with each participant. That is in depth. Yeah, well, it was. And then, you know, one of the time, there's, there's that, this is a note for everyone doing a PhD. Yeah, yeah I certainly had that, that paranoia that, that there's never enough data. I must yeah. gather more data. So I ended up with I think, you know, 20 participants trying 20. to do three, okay. three rides yeah. with each one, as well as all those interviews with the planners and the engineers mm. and the activists, you know. So um, I ended up with way too much, I think. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and I think that that's interesting. It's, before you set out, my, my supervisor actually like sat down with me and was like, OK, wait, but if we do the calculations, yeah. you said you're going to do 20 at three rides per person, you, yeah. you do the math, and then you do the math on the transcription, yeah. and you can really get yourself into a hole. Oh, right? I mean, the transcription was, <laughs> was a hole, for sure. <laughs> you know, that was uh, towards the end of that, that couldn't end soon enough, really. Yeah. But, but again, you know, it, that's always a valuable exercise, the transcription, doing, we'll go doing straight that yourself. Oh. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, uh, this conference here this year is in Delft uh, second annual conference uh, how is this experience different from last year in Amsterdam uh, especially in relation to you know the physical location that we're in um, I mean so I have been to Delft before it was yeah. about 10 10 or so years ago um, but I couldn't really remember any of it I just remembered it was nice um, <laughs> compared to Amsterdam the physical situation I think it's it's a calmer version of Amsterdam. You know, it's smaller, yeah. it's 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 calmer. Um, it's still got its bike rush hour, and I still think you have to. Um, what time is it? Is it rush hour? No, it is now yeah. four, three, three forty. So yeah, no, we're it not is not into, rush hour right now. Maybe into the semi rush yeah. hour. But <laughs> Amsterdam, when I was there last year, that was my first time there, and that felt like you kind of had to have a decent level of local knowledge you know, about okay. what was kind of expected of you as a as a cyclist, just because there was so many people, the, the kind of margin for error was that right. much less, you know, um, if you can, you know, start acting like a tourist. <laughs> uh, whereas, whereas here, it feels a little more, you know, okay, I can make a few mistakes, mm -hmm. and there's more margin for error, I can probably get away with that. I've already, uh, I crashed into a few things already. Yeah, yeah. Slowly, obviously. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Me, not so slowly. <laughs> uh, and I want to kind of talk about the the future of cycling yeah. research because we just we just had a session where you know we 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 really talked about whether you know this idea of cycling research is overproduced. Yeah. But then we got the counter argument that like well. You know, automobile research is really, really where it's yeah. overproduced, right? Yeah. And where the, the capital and the budget is being spent on. Yeah. So I don't know if you have a, a take on on how we should proceed uh, as academics in the field of cycling. Um, no, I mean, there is no no one take there. I think everyone has their has their own interest that they're pursuing. I mean, I think um, Samuel was was right when he hit on that idea of institutions and maybe you know we know a lot of what we we need to do it's a lot of what we need to ask is why can't we implement it uh -huh. you know why can't we make it happen in these contexts and again we know some of the answers there but um that a lot of that is so context specific the politics of it you know how do we how do we activate citizens how do we uh you know, how do we promote cycling and smooth the path to creating, you know, cycling subjects whilst at the same time, you know, slowly but carefully making that driving subject yeah. less uh, slowly and carefully. Yeah, you know, because, yeah. you know, you, you make dramatic shifts there and 
and people get cross, you know, yeah. and, and rightly so, because they're just trying to go about their, their social lives. We all are. You, yeah, yeah, we all are. And, <laughs> you know, if that becomes dramatically harder overnight, then people get cross. And it's that, that incremental uh, nature of it is, is hard. We'll make and a right. People go, right, yeah. yeah. People forget that in the, in the kind of Dutch context, you know, you want to change your city to look like Delft in five years. Well, no, Delft taken a good 50 years yeah. and then some, you know. So we, we have to realize the incremental nature of that and, and create these roadmaps. Uh, so I think the political and the institutional is, is key there. Um, and yeah, perhaps getting beyond some of this slightly more simplistic policy learning mm -hmm. kind of, and policy transfer. Let's, let's go way back in your life for, uh, to w when, you, when you got interested in the topic of cycling. You yourself uh, w raced or, or did an uh, ethnographic it, study of, of road uh, cyclists? Yeah, you know, I did, I did a bit around then because I think I was, I was kind of, you know, I, like a lot of people interested in cycling when I was younger, dropped it in my teenage years, got a motorbike, picked it back up again, you know, a bit later on. And so I was very keen and started doing a bit of racing and stuff when I was 25. But, and it actually, when I went to do a PhD, it wasn't until I was about 30 that um, I had no intention of researching cycling for my oh, PhD. Yeah, okay. I did it, I did it for my master's because I thought, well, hell, you know, I'll just do what I enjoy. Yeah. And I was doing a lot of cycling. So and the, the Mod 1, 2 paper came out of that. But then after it, I wanted to focus on, I think it was the political economy of news media. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh -huh. um, but my supervisor, I think quite wisely, said, why don't you do cycling? <laughs> Stick to and, what you know. <laughs> yeah, and I think he was, I think he was right. I think he, uh, he made a good call. Um, thanks, Phil. Uh, <laughs> and um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's how I've come to kind of be in the place that I am now. And I'm quite, quite glad about it. You know, it is, as you probably know, George, it's a privileged position to be in. It is a very privileged you know, position writing to Writing and researching in. about the thing that you like, is, yeah. uh, it doesn't get much better. <laughs> wow. Uh, do you think this uh, cycling policy is going to get changed at all with the Brexit? Ooh. Oh, no, there's too many no, things no, no. up in the air when you mention the B word. Uh -huh. um, so I don't know, you know, the, the, the most optimistic version of myself says that the country could go in a really positive direction. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, I'm, I'm not sure, sure that's going to happen. Yeah, I, I honestly, it's too hard to say what's going to happen with transport policy. My feeling is that we will just carry on doing much of the same and that a lot of, lot of the positive influence from Europe um, will dry up in the sense that some of those formal links will disappear. Some of the things that have made collaboration with Europe yeah. easier may dry up. It's not that we don't want to collaborate. And I think uh, when most of us will still try and collaborate mm. with our European and international partners, but it will just be that much harder to some extent. Yeah. Um, so hopefully things are, you know, things aren't going to drastically change every overnight, <laughs> you know, I hope. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just put a little, another little barrier possibly yeah. in our way in terms of collaboration, because we've got so much to learn from our European partners and also, you know, We've we've had a few successes ourselves as well. Yeah, so. uh, there was uh, there was a study uh, that I read. I think two weeks ago, I realized that the Great Britain isn't all that far behind the U.S. in terms of obesity, uh, especially childhood obesity. It is actually way up there. Yeah. So, uh, but then I looked at the urban form of most UK cities. They they're quite historic. They got narrow roads. Uh, and it, it really puzzles me how a, a place that has such a different urban form than, than the U.S. Yeah. Um, can then, at the same time, have such low rates of active transportation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. You could, you know, you might think, you know, you look at those narrow streets in mm -hmm. Delft, and you think, oh, automatically, okay, cars are going to go slowly, and people are more likely to walk and cycle. Yeah. Then you look at, you know, yeah, as you say, a, a, your average UK town, um, and Lo and behold, narrow streets, but higher speed limits and more cars, less yeah. walking and cycling. So how does this, yeah, how, how is this kind of played out? We have uh, priority here. So we oh, just okay. keep going. We'll go left. Um, oh, we're getting into rush hour. So this is the main route from the university, basically, to the yeah. train station. Ah, yes. And we'll get to kind of so ride in the start, school. Start getting people. a bit busy. 
Uh, any words for, for beginning researchers, uh, people doing their PhDs, uh, or even the late stages of their masters? Oh. Oh. Uh, <laughs> um, hopefully you're already doing what you enjoy uh, <laughs> and what, what, what interests you, so yeah. stick, stick with that. I think um, with the cycling research in particular, try and stay engaged with uh, central and local government policy. Um, even though that might be uh, <laughs> easier said than done. Yeah. Try and try and get in there, um, maintain your voice in those kind of circles. Um, it's something I'm still working on and it's quite sporadic. Um, I think you're much better at that kind of stuff, George. Um, you know, I'm going to take a master class from you. <laughs> well, yeah. just I think we'll, we'll end it here on this uh, beautiful riverfront of Delft. Uh, thank you so much for for joining me today. We're thank, gonna try this. Thank hand you for the invite. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna try this handshake while riding. So, <laughs> cheers, cheers, Justin. Yeah, cheers. I'll George. see you next time, eh? Yeah, take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.